How do you know it's working? It says record. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Marilyn Parr, and today is Wednesday, December the 8th, 2004. This is the beginning of an interview with Thomas Bowles, Jr., and Thomas was born on October the 12th, 1916. You got it. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Tom, could you tell us a little bit about your early upbringing, where you were born, where you went to school? I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, with where my mother and father and two sisters lived. And went to high school there, at Ramsey High School in Birmingham, Alabama. Went there the day it was open, a brand new high school. And then after two years, my father and all of the family moved to Virginia because that was in 1930, 31, and he went busted in the Depression and so moved back to his home in Virginia. And he lived in Virginia until later. He got married and moved to Richmond, I mean to Atlanta. So you were in high school. When did you, did you graduate high school? Graduated in Richmond, Virginia from Thomas Jefferson High School in Richmond, Virginia. Graduated in 1930. Uh, 33, two years of high school in Birmingham and the last two years of high school in Richmond, Virginia. Then I started working, but I went to the University of Richmond at night taking courses, and I'm in the, quote, class, unquote, of 1967 since I started in 1933, four years. What were you majoring in? What were you Well, I took to uh, accounting and law and public speaking. Um, those were my three major courses at the night school. It was the J.C. Williams Law School, which was a part of the University of Richmond. And I went there for several years. So at that point, then, you would have graduated. You finished. Graduated college. I didn't graduate, you know, with them. I finished course I had started on and started working. And who did you work for? Life Insurance Company of Virginia. My f uncle, my father's brother, was the Commissioner of Insurance for the state of Virginia. Matter of fact, he was the Commissioner of Insurance for probably 25 years. And he was a native, of course, of Virginia, as all my family were, my father and so forth. And I started working at the Life Insurance Company of Virginia. And studied, continued my studies there, and studied f for the actuarial exams, and later completed the actuarial exams and became a fellow of a society of actuaries. And after that, another fellow from the Life of Virginia and I left and organized our consulting firm called Bowles, Andrews, and Town. About what year would that have been? 1948. Okay. And. Um, Town was an actuary too. Bob Town was an actuary. He was the senior actuary for the Life Insurance Company of Virginia, and I was the associate actuary for the Life of Virginia. And so we teamed up with uh, a well-known character in Virginia, person, T. Coleman Andrews. And T. Coleman Andrews was had been auditor of public accounts for the city of Richmond. He had been controller for the state of Virginia, or vice versa, I knew what the titles were. And he headed his own accounting firm, T. Coleman Andrews and Company. And he was a real star. He had been president of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And quite a, quite a star. A handsome, tall, bronzed, white-haired guy. <laughs> when he'd walk in, people would, you know, look. <laughs> so in but, between this time frame, we've talked about 1933 to 1948. There's this thing called a war that breaks out in between all of this. That's right. So in 1941, with Pearl Harbor, and it just was yesterday's anniversary, where were you and what were you doing then? Well, the, the Pearl Harbor occurred on a Sunday morning, as I recall. And I remember it, because quite vividly, the announcement, the radio announcement, the President Roosevelt speaking. And so I was still with the Life of Virginia on December the 7th of 1941. <coughs> and then because I went into the draft, I was drafted and drafted uh, actually 1st of April, 1942. 
I tried to get the, uh, the draft board to defer my draft date for a couple of months so I could take another examination for the Society of Actuaries, but they denied that, so I was drafted. So at that point, you were already 20, 26? Well, let's see, you subtract uh, from 1942 to 1960, and I was 26. 26 years old. 26. Were you, had you expected, as, you, as, as it seemed like the war was breaking out, that you would have had to serve? Being 26, a little bit older, Yeah. did you expect that you would have been drafted and had to serve? Well, of course, we didn't expect Pearl Harbor. Not expecting Pearl Harbor, of course, we didn't expect uh, the war, of course. So, uh, the, um, uh, of course, then, you know, everybody's working, making a, digging, a, trying to eke out a living for himself and so forth. So, what, so what I, were your thoughts when you got the draft letter? What, did, what were my thoughts? I, I don't recall. I, this is it. I got to go. Just another experience, and you don't look much further beyond just that particular day. So I was drafted and went down to Petersburg, Virginia, to Fort Lee, and went through the uh, process of being brought into the Army, the Armed Services. Stayed there for a while, and they shipped me down to, <coughs> to Gulfport, Mississippi, and I became a soldier for Uncle Sam in the U.S. Army. I went to anti went to aircraft mechanic school. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Just didn't know one one bolt from another or a screwdriver from pliers. I reckon. Had you ever flown at that point? Oh no, I'd not flown. <clears throat> and was this something you were just you were assigned to aircraft mechanic? Right to the school. See, I was drafted in April. I went to Keesler Field in Biloxi, Mississippi. And uh, in basic training there, and then that would be in late April of 40, 42. And then taking all these exams they give you, I was later offered the opportunity to go to Officers Candidate School. And Wilmington, North Carolina, anti-aircraft artillery, which was then part of the coast artillery, I believe, but later became separate. <clears throat> so I went to Camp Davis in Wilmington, North Carolina, and became, after the usual 90 days, a 90-day wonder, which, is, which means I became a second lieutenant in Uncle Sam's U.S. Army. Tell us a little bit about what that was like, just the whole basic training. You had gone through college, so now you're in a different environment, well, yeah, basic but training. It, and it, it, was, it was different because you were thrown with people from all over. I heard a language I never heard before. <laughs> Seen people doing things I'd never been exposed to before. So it was a beginning of a new life, I suppose, really. And uh, uh, being just a shy sort of a guy working as an actuarial student in the life of Virginia. I didn't have much exciting going on until that happened. During all this time of your training, of course, the war is going on. Um, North Africa is getting to be planned, that campaign. How much did you follow what was going on and what were your feelings about when it was going to be your turn to actually well, not, go? I really didn't even think about that. You just played it you know, by ear, day by day, doing the best you could. And then when I got my second lieutenant's bars and became a 90-day wonder, I was given a two weeks leave, and I went back to Virginia, where my family, of course, were living, and went back and displayed those second lieutenant's bars like a real king. You know? <laughs> How did your family feel about you being in the military? Oh, I don't know. The usual emotional reaction to having one of their children go off to the war. Uh, I don't I suppose felt like anybody else would have felt any other parent. So you were in the States until when? When did you actually ship out? Let's see, we, I went from, when I finished my leave, I went to 
Fort Dix, New Jersey. And part of the, was assigned to the 16th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Group and with the headquarters company. And I was a, a, a communications officer and the 16th Artillery Group and also involved in, in, in communications and, and operation. Well, the communications really were part of what they call S2 or G2 operations and studied and took part in all the training exercises. And, and then we got exposed to the weapons we'd be using, the 50 millimeter machine guns and the 40 millimeter anti-aircraft weapons and the 90 millimeter guns that we had in, in, in the war, I mean in France. So four decks and then Let's see, that was in, I became a 90 day wonder, I believe, in September of 42. And in 43, um, let's see, 43 until about the first part of June of 40. Let's see, 40. Get confused at the No, that's okay. It's a <laughs> Trying to think about when you when you were here in the States and then when you shipped when, overseas. And then we went to, I remember vividly the the transfer from, well, we, from Fort Dix, they sent it out to Cape Cod, where we entered into a lot of, had a lot of training, both in the weapons and the deployment of units in anti-aircraft defense. And then from Cape Cod, we were, went back to what we were, be sent overseas, so we went to New Brunswick, New Jersey, which was a staging area, as I recall it. And then they, on, they then took us from New Brunswick to the port in Manhattan. We got on the ship, the uh, name of the ship, the uh, and I should always remember that. I can't think of it now, but it was a. But we stayed on the ship for a week, and then they announced that we couldn't go on the ship because the ship had sprung a leak. <laughs> so they took us off the ship, sent us back to the staging area in New Brunswick, New Jersey, across the Hudson River. And we stayed there, then we came back. Same and, ship? They fixed no, it? came back. Different? I came back, and on the ferry, I never will forget this, and I've told this several times, on the ferry and on these advertising placards they have up on the side of the uh, boat, the ferry boat, picture of a beautiful gal and she says, ask yourself this question, is this trip really necessary? <laughs> <laughs> so for you it's this whole trip so, of having so to they go put us on the, they put us on the Queen Elizabeth. So you were on the QE? No, that boat we that sprung the leak was the Ile de France, I S L E de France, uh, and then we swapped out, of course, for the Queen Elizabeth, and it had about fifteen thousand people on it, and we took off uh, overseas. And uh, how long was the, the about four, four, four or five nights? And one night, about two o'clock in the morning, they had the, rang the alarm, and everybody was aroused, of course, uh, throwing your life jackets because there was a submarine alert and they wanted to get people, you know, out of the bunks in case there was an attack against the Queen Elizabeth. But we, Queen Elizabeth, you know, didn't go in convoy, it sailed alone. It's right interesting. I mean, it was to me that most of the troop ships were part of convoys, and, but the Queen Elizabeth, the fast ship, out, out to run submarines if they could anticipate their approach. And so we went unscathed and landed in Glasgow, or the port at Glasgow, Scotland. Do you remember when that was? What, what year would that be? Was well, that 43? It was 43? in 40, 40, 40, spring of 40, uh, 43, I reckon. No, it was in 43. Because, um, let's see, 43, I reckon. 
springtime, so that it was you. You trained then for an additional year. In yeah, we went. Then they put us all to train in Glasgow, and we were, the train took us down to Western Superman, which is on the Bristol Channel in England. And we stayed in Western Superman for the rest of the time that I was in the. We were there. I mean, in England. And then one thing is right interesting, and it, I didn't ever see anything published about this until relatively recently. Um, there was a practice invasion. I don't know whether people were aware of this or not, but I saw it written up once, but it's sort of really hush hush out of record. There was a practice invasion down on the southern shore of England that called Slapton Sands. Does that ring a bell? With I, I have read about it, but oh, tell me about it. It's Slapton Sands. And so we went from Western Superman with all the troops and down to participate in that practice invasion at Slapton Sands, uh, boarding the you know the the troop carriers and so forth, and and then later uh, and then when that was over, we went back to Western Superman. And right interesting, one of the fellow who was the uh, major and was the I was assistant operations officer. And he was the top dog, but he had been drinking a lot, <laughs> and he uh, wasn't in best shape the morning we left to go to Slapton Sand, so a few days later they shipped him to Iceland. <laughs> so were you, you were part of the exercise, did you yeah, see yeah. what had gone wrong, did you? Oh uh, no, I was not aware of what was going wrong. No, How did you begin to hear about that there had been well, an I, attack? Uh, I don't really remember. I never heard of the, any of the details about the casualties. We, you know, the Germans sank three or four of our troop ships in the rear. You, you read about this and probably have it. Quite, quite a number died, and you. Oh yeah, yeah. And they hushed it up because it had been really a sort of a disaster to widely spread the news about the, the ignominious defeat we had suffered at Slapton Sands. So, uh, we so went you back were to, aware of it. Were you told not to talk about well, it? Well, didn't know what was. No, we were not told anything. We were, didn't know what was going on, except we were, did what we were supposed to do from the beach and boarding a landing craft, an LCT, and so forth. But we, we weren't. I wasn't. I don't know anybody was aware of what really had happened in that whole whole exercise because it was spread. It was in the British in the uh, Channel, of course. And, the Germans ever did. I read in, I think, a National Geographic or something that Germans had had some PT boats and come up in the rear and sank three or four of our troop carriers that were going down the channel as part of the exercise. Well, I, nobody in our unit ever talked about it, knew anything about it. It was we just we were oblivious to the whole thing. Really, went back to Western Super. But, so your day-to-day -day was a lot of training, but when you did have some time off and went into the towns, what was your impression of, of England? Oh, we loved England. I loved England. Occasionally on weekends we'd go to London and we'd stay, a couple of fellas and I would stay at the YMCA, get up on the roof of the YMCA at night, watch the, the bombers come over, drop bombs, and they had a, the British uh, pilots knocking, knocking them down, the airplanes down, quite an experience. Front seat. <laughs> Yeah, then they sent us up to in some special training exercise. They sent our unit up to the the northwest of England to some special training in the the employment of 50 millimeter uh, machine guns and anti aircraft anti aircraft defense for you know low flying planes and whatnot. So, but uh, they finally they, they by the way they one of the my real fine experiences was. Uh, as an operations officer, they gave me a BIGOT, B-I-G-O-T, classification, which is, was, you know, was highly secret BIGOT classification. And I'd go from Western Superman over to the headquarters of Eisenhower, where the planning staff was, to be a part of the group planning the anti-aircraft defenses of the landing beaches. And I have been filed out a lot of the diagrams showing where we had plotted the guns to be and so forth. And I got a big file of a whole lot of stuff that includes a lot of that. So how early on can you remember before the D-Day invasion were you made aware of it? 
Oh, probably, uh, should have probably June 6th was the invasion, right? And it was probably April. Okay. Yeah, I knew about it in April. Of course, it was <laughs> Hard not to talk about. <laughs> Can't even hear stories about somebody had been drinking out, you know, at the club and let some word slip and wham, he was away, shipped to, to Iceland, for example, <laughs> or somewhere, I've gotten out of that. But it, it was, uh, well, it, it never occurred to me, it, it, you know, we were told that what it was and don't, don't talk about it, what the dangers were. He never thought about it. I mean, about telling it. <laughs> Did you get the sense, though, that, that for others who didn't have as much information, I mean, people still knew the invasion was coming. It was just a matter of when. I mean, all the men who were in England and they're all preparing, they know they're going well, they eventually. That, yeah, we knew that the, the, the troops even, couldn't even talk about it in my own unit. I mean, I, uh, with that bigot classification, you know, you, your mouth was shut as soon as you left the area, the stage of the area down at the Eisenhower's headquarters. He wasn't there, but that's where they did all of the planning, for, a lot of the planning for the invasion. And so you have to go back from there and look at all the stuff I have showing the maps we made and the deployment of guns and troops on the beach and up, up on the, uh, the, left, the land above the beaches and so forth. They're interesting. And uh, so that was in April, and then the time came to go for the invasion. And they moved the troops down into this, what they call the staging areas. And I never will forget, of course, I won't forget any break, but I remember one thing in particular. The time came about, I reckon, two days before we were to get on the invasion craft. We had a meeting of our troops, uh, 16th headquarters, and the others were doing the same thing. And I had to present to them the, the, the map showing where the invasion was going to be, and so forth, and just discuss it with the rest of the people who didn't know anything about it. But uh, I had a big board there with a map, had a cloth draped over it, and the map showed the whole invasion uh, uh, land and the beaches and whatnot. And I remember so vividly asking the assembled troops, said, where, where do you think the invasion is going to take place? Nobody guessed Normandy. <laughs> it blew my mind. <laughs> which, which beach were you actually assigned to? I was to? in Omaha. Okay. No, nobody guessed where it was going to be. What were, what were some of their guesses? Well, the, they guessed uh, Pas de Calais and all of them, well, and Cherbourg. And, but at that look, nobody, and you, I remember pulling that cover off the map and whew, <laughs> it was right fascinating. <laughs> were they, were they, Convinced though, once you presented the oh, case, yeah. it was a, it wasn't a sham. They, they, it was a couple of days before we were going to get on the boats and go. And then they moved us in and got on the boats. And I was on an LCT, and we had uh, a forty millimeter uh, guns on it. And I got on it. It was foggy and rainy, and I know I pitched my sleeping bag up on the poop deck of I don't know what you call it, the rear of the LCT up level and all down in the main level where the guns and the troops were and where the gate falls down in front of the LCT. And I went to, went to sleep. <laughs> how many how many people were on this uh, LCT roughly? I don't know roughly it was a, it, I bring it had uh, I, I really don't know it wasn't a you know, you've, you've seen the LCTs and with the guns and the jeeps and the one a whole lot of people but the ones necessary for the initial, for what we were doing. We were taking over the ones required to actually establish 40 millimeter anti-aircraft guns on the beach and upon the uh, land above, if, assuming we could get there. And I don't know how many people. Well, there. you would have had to transfer off of the LCT as you got closer to shore, or oh, would yeah. you? Well, they're right interesting. <laughs> I put, put my, uh, this was the night of the 4th of, June, and I put my sleeping bag down on the deck and went to sleep. <laughs> Next morning I woke up and there we were. Hadn't moved a bit. <laughs> <laughs> the morning of the 5th. Well, you know the story of me. Mean. <laughs>
They had a one day delay had for one weather. Day delay. So I woke up and said, my God, yeah, what do we, <laughs> this is the way it's going to be on the base. That's terrific. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, they were, and they, there were some announcements. <clears throat> you see, the ship was uh, part of the Navy. The Navy uh, ran the ships. Right. And I will forget the night, on the night of the uh, 4th, the Navy invited the officers of that ship, uh, whether they were lieutenant or ensign, invited some of our officer staff down to the mess dining room, and we had steaks and ice cream. No, we, so we didn't go, and we stayed there all day. And went the next day, went back to sleep. And now this whole time, everybody else has to stay on oh, the yeah, ship. Oh yeah, stayed on the ship. Nobody got off the ship. When you think that if if we hadn't controlled the air, the invasion that would have taken place. Think of that mass of armor and personnel all over southern England. But we had absolute control of the air. And of course, obviously, that's, that was the plan. To, and the British uh, soldiers with their Spitfires and, and the Americans too, but uh, it had been hopeless without the control of the air. And when we landed on Norman, well, we, we was, I was in <coughs> the, my schedule, our unit schedule was to land at H hour plus start to land and we would disembark. We'd leave our ship at H hour plus <clears throat> I think it was H hour plus two hours or something. It was all, all precisely planned. And but we didn't leave until about H hour plus eight. The thing was there was, you know, the delay of the <clears throat> well, fascinating thing to me was the on, on the deck of that L C T watching the U.S. destroyers going up and down parallel to the beach. Boom, boom, shoot, trying to blow those pillboxes out. That was a gorgeous sight, you fight, it's beautiful. But it's, it was fascinating to watch that. You don't see much of that in the, I mean, the movies were made, you don't you didn't see that part of it, but they just go up and down parallel to the beach with their guns, boom, boom, trying to blow those pillboxes out. Then finally with, uh, came Time for our ship to to uh, our LCT to move into position and let the thing down the gate. They bowed out. I was in the jeep with a driver, and, and uh, <clears throat> I had another fellow who was on another. His name was his name, but he and I had comparable assignments. We would go to the beach, and we had on a map where we'd establish our what they called a report center. From that point on with the radio, we would control the incoming anti-aircraft weapons. But we let that thing down, and uh, our jeep, and, and the driver and I, and the jeep drove down into the water. We were submerged. Of course, they waterproofed all the jeeps <coughs> with the <coughs> breathing tubes above water so they could run underwater. Right, fascinating. And uh, so we went down, hit the bottom, which was maybe water was maybe two feet, three feet deep or something, and drove into the beach, and God, they, well, all hell broke loose everywhere. You could see it, the ships blowing up, and the, the old the USS, I think it was the Alabama battleship, way behind the destroyers. It was lobbing shells way over the beach back into the rear to disrupt communications and transportation and, well, there against the, the Germans. Quite a, quite a show. We know later that there were a lot of problems at Omaha, but did you have a sense that things weren't going well when you landed? Well, <clears throat> not, not really, because I, our group was only co concerned with and aware of what we were supposed to do, and uh, we didn't know anything about, I mean, they didn't instruct us on how the infantry was moving here and there. We knew all hell was breaking loose, and we, uh, First thing we did, we got there seeing what the problem was. We dug a couple of foxholes in the sand on the beach, and we stayed there that first night on the beach. And the terrifying thing about that was that they had what they call the uh, uh, lone 
Sloan, Charlie, or something, a German bomber. You could look down the beach and you could see him coming at night, dropping his bomb. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, right along where we were. He was scared to live in daylight. <laughs> Out of you, of course. And one of the bombs hit about, I reckon, oh, said 50 yards from ours and was killing people, of course, and blowing. Knocking sand all around, dug out, not our dug out, but our foxhole. But then we stayed there all night, and <clears throat> and uh, I know I was in a, uh, some fellow soldier came along, and he was pretty much destroyed and sort of beginning to lose it a little mentally. We pulled him down into our foxhole, squeezed him in, and he he was in bad shape, really, not physically, I mean mentally, he was. It's, uh, well, obviously, you've seen the movies, it really did. Can thing. you describe for us a little bit about what it looked like for you? What were you seeing and hearing? Well, we weren't hearing, uh, we were only hearing what we could hear from the battle there. But uh, and we weren't aware of what the assignments were, the goals were for the infantry. And all we knew about was our limited uh, anti-aircraft defense deployment. And when we got ashore, the other fellow who also was uh, he was uh, both of us were captains at the time. <coughs> we made contact with the coming incoming guns, and we knew where they were going to be. And, and uh, that's we had short vision, really. We didn't. We weren't aware of. You, you see the the movie, The Longest Day, and what's it? Rescuing Private. What's the, saving Private saving Ryan? Private Ryan. We, we 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 weren't aware of any of that. Of the Point de Hoc, uh, the, the going up. We we were just exposed to and concerned with that which we were supposed to do with our anti-aircraft activities. So if we were living in like not a shell, but we weren't aware. Until so we, how many men were you responsible for or you worked well, together? Well, we in our, uh, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, commanding troops. I was only in charge of controlling the emplacement of, of anti-aircraft weapons. <clears throat> so it wasn't how many men was I in charge of. Um, we we had we had to put up fifty gallon fifty caliber machine guns on the beach at places where we planted. We also had been trained uh, to use the fifty caliber for, for anti personnel too, not just for anti low flying anti aircraft. So we, we had a rather narrow vision of, of, of the global activities. We were only concerned of staying alive and being sure we'd you'd be deep enough in the foxhole at night for if it came along they wouldn't be blowing our heads off. And we weren't aware of that until I saw the longest day. I didn't you know what at that time. I mean I didn't know what was going on at that time. Did you anticipate that there would be a lot of enemy aircraft? That's well, what you were prepared for. Well we were prepared for it. But I never will forget the uh, the first day one of the most comforting sights of all was to see the sky almost black with lightning P-38s coming, coming across from England, but giving us a cover so it boy, gave you a good, warm, comfortable feeling. So we didn't, uh, in that that particular part, we didn't, we weren't exposed to much any any enemy aircraft at all except for this long bomber at night and occasionally we'd, we'd, somebody would slip through and our outpost uh, observers would pick it and we would fire on them but we, it was very little, very little aircraft uh, contact. The one that you mentioned, was anybody able to shoot him down? No, he, at night, <laughs> coming about a hundred feet above the, the shore, he could shoot. So you made it through your first day. Made it through the first day. Then we, the second day we went, uh, got up on the, up on the, uh, not the cliffs, but the, what do you call it, behind the beach, beach cliff. And we stayed there with, uh, stayed there well into the, I reckon the San Lope Breakthrough. And before that time, during that time, I was assigned to by, uh, Colonel, my boss, to accompany 
uh, some of the uh, go into the front lines and observe what was going on because we, we were using a 90 millimeter anti-aircraft guns now at that time for anti-tank guns. And I went with a group uh, of 90 millimeters uh, and we went down the road and uh, German, what, what was the, the 81, uh, German, the German 88 uh, came around the bend and boy, a 90 millimeter just blew into smithereens of the tank. But um, then they would occasionally send me up to be an observer and report to the colonel, uh, the, uh, my, our commander. And I was spent one night up there in the hedgerow and the effort you, you get more scared of living daylights out of it. Get up there, you're in the hedgerow, digging down deep, and guns popping everywhere, and people getting shot. But uh, finally, next morning, it, things eased up some, and I get back to where I'm supposed to be. But it was, it was interesting. Did you? Were you surprised each day that you? I mean, you survived that first day. You survived that second day. Was there? Did you think about it much? No, you, you don't. No. Every day, tomorrow's another day. Let's let's get going. I mean, the thing that in this uh, article I told you, I wrote uh, the thing that I remember so vividly. The, when you got up above, the fields were covered with signs, German signs, "Achtung, Menin," <laughs> you know, attention, mines, mines all over, any personnel mines all over. And see a lot of cattle had been killed, and they were on the backs all bloated, and they, you know, it was, it was quite a, and um, we, we, another fellow and I, about our fifth or sixth day, one, decided it'd be nice to have a little uh, milk to drink. <laughs> so we went to a farmhouse in which had been partially destroyed. People in the French, the folks were still living in it. And we would say to, uh, Chocolate for du lait, chocolate for milk. <laughs> we'll take a canteen, we we'll give them some chocolate. <laughs> and they give us a canteen full of milk. <laughs> they back and drink milk. <laughs> of course, the army wants service, serving any fresh milk as part of its diet. <laughs> so, how many candy bars did you have to negotiate oh, with? Were you well supplied in candy bars? <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Uh, none of. Um, I didn't smoke and <clears throat> never have, and so I didn't. Didn't have the lure. Cigarettes uh, for. Were you able they, to trade your cigarettes for chocolate and other things? Sometimes, yeah. Of course, the uh, chocolates you got in your your rations, uh, and that saved some of those uh, bartering. But uh, quite a. You were and so they, Oh, and the same thing about the Sandlow breakthrough. One of the great. They didn't talk about this either, and we, we knew about it, but nobody ever talked about it. We were going to have um, uh, uh, anti uh, 80 millimeters to lay a smoke screen, not a screen, but a folk, uh, a smoke above a certain position uh, we were attacking at, at San Lo with smoke bombs. Or what, what are they, you know, on the line we'd blow them up. And the aircraft were to use, planned to use our smoke that we put it as a point of dropping the bombs, and the wind came along and blew the smoke and dropped a lot of bombs on our own troops, killed a lot of people. And that was, uh, of course you could say it was anti-aircraft, but it did what we were supposed to do, or they were supposed how, to do. How soon were you aware that that happened? I wasn't aware happened. of that until maybe two or three, a couple of weeks later, if from some of our commanders, or the colonel I think told me about it. But none of those things that, you know, would publish right away would be bad. You were awarded the Bronze Star. Can you tell us a little bit about well, that? Well, I was awarded for my, the, it just said for my participation in, in services on the assault on Normandy. And um, it was, of course, a surprise to me, but when the Colonel uh, announced that the uh, Bronze Star had been awarded to me and Captain, uh, what his name was, who had gotten off the on the LCT at the same time moved to show. So I didn't, uh, I wouldn't, you know, I didn't deserve it. <laughs>
At what, uh, how, how was that presented to you? How much later? Was it in the field? Do you remember? Oh, it wasn't in the field. It was, I don't know uh, later it was. The colonel told me about it. In due time, I received a certificate, and I have it home in my file now. That I think the bronze star to my, one of my sons. So had two and had, had one, and so I gave it to him, and he still has it. I didn't do anything heroic. I just done, as I say, I just done my duty. <laughs> and you kept on doing your duty after St. Lo. Do you just you you moved along as the troops moved along? Can you tell right. us where you went after? Right. You were in France, and then where did you go? Well, we went uh, after the breakthrough at St. Lo, and uh, Patton, the landing of that one, Avalanches down south of the Brittany Peninsula. We just moved through France like a plague. I didn't get into Paris. We, our, our unit went south of Paris, going east, and uh, crossed uh, uh, the river Seine. Got the name of the place south of Paris, but I didn't get into Paris at all. That not at all. Not not no, during no, not no. later uh, Paris, but uh, not during the hostilities because uh, we were moving so fast. Well, we would go this way, and that's where we So you were part of Patton's Third Army? Oh, no, 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 not Patton. No, we're not. This, that was First Army. Patton uh, didn't get involved in Patton until the Battle of the Bulge. We were in Luxembourg. I never will forget, the, we were there in Luxembourg all about Christmas. What a beautiful place it was. <laughs> and then the Battle of the Bulge started, and Patton was, with his Third Army, was south. They moved north to, up to the Battle of the Bulge and came through Luxembourg, and we were then assigned, taken from the First Army and assigned to the Third Army. And after that Battle of the Bulge was over, we went back to the First Army. But uh, we, uh, I was in, we were going north towards the Bastogne, that area, and I was in a jeep and in a tank column. We were. Tell somebody didn't get a Purple Heart, but we had an accident uh, crashing into tanks or something. It threw me in the ditch. It took me to the field hospital and sold up my my eye. But, but uh, that was not a, uh, a you know a war injury. And so I, they said, "You get a Purple Heart?" I said, "No, that wasn't a Purple Heart thing. It wasn't in combat." <laughs> Did that did that uh, German offensive surprise you? Oh yeah, of course it did. Yeah, yeah. Luxembourg City, which is where we were. By the way, we were our headquarters unit was stationed in Luxembourg, right outside of Luxembourg, a little north of the city, in a chateau, a lovely chateau, and and that was about the time the Germans had started deploying their buzz bombs, their the first buzz bomb. And uh, <laughs> I think the most frightening thing you'd be is to be out, so particularly at night. They'd use a lot of them most of the night. You hear them coming, but, but you, you know, they hear them. Then they'd cut off. The noise would cease. As you know, that was the end. It was going plummet to the earth and then whatever was away from blowing the smithereens. Uh, once uh, near where we were stationed, our headquarters, I was out there at night and I, and I heard the buzz bomb coming. You saw the engines cut off, and I suppose it, it exploded maybe a uh, hundred yards from where we were at the time. But they, they were frightening those buzz bombs. And then later, when they did the the, the, the longer range ones, what do they call the buzz bomb two or something? They'd fire those to go over the channel and go into Great Britain. You know, but just by just a hair, just by a veritable hair. We, we could have been defeated in that war. It's what do you think was the turning point? What do you think made the difference? Well, I think, um, well, after the battle of the Bulge, of course, the, 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 everything fell to pieces. But what do you think made that successful for us? Made what successful for us? To turn around the battle of the Bulge. Well, just the sheer guts and determination of our our soldiers and the planning of our, our, our leaders and the, and the, and the 
controlling the movement of troops and like moving the Third Army south into the Battle of the Bulge. We hadn't done that, we probably. And then the, <clears throat> the, the classic response, you know, for demanding that we surrender. Nuts! <laughs> well, just, you would have felt the same way? Oh, yeah. What, the, uh, just the, the, Hold on just a second. That's right. We had a brief interruption to change the audio tape, and we are now continuing with the interview with Tom Bowles. We were talking about the Battle of the Bulge being over, and now we're moving forward. Then the, I remember the next big battle, not battle, but my exposure to the real famous operation was crossing the Roar River. And I remember we had of course, the regular field artillery, we had a 90 millimeters there too, as part of the artillery. And uh, someone said, or I once read later, that the artillery barrage at that time was probably one of the biggest artillery assaults and barrages in the history of the world. You could almost read a newspaper there at night. <laughs> it, was, it was something. And, um, and then um, one thing I got. Right, I'll never forget when you, you get when we got on the cliffs beyond the and moving through the roads and some first time I'd ever been exposed to the real tragedy of war, seeing dead soldiers lying in the, in the ditches. It just sort of something you never forget, but uh, if German soldiers. And, and, uh, but after the war, then interesting. Uh, one of my interesting experiences was the crossing of the Rhine. About th three o'clock one morning we were west of the Rhine. The colonel woke me up and said, Tom, we've got to get some anti-aircraft weapons up to the Ludendorff Bridge at, uh, at, uh, at the Rhine, at Remagen, because the, the infantry has looked like they've captured intact the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen. And it's going to be viciously attacked by the German air that was left to destroy it. So we've got to get some anti-aircraft. So we moved some 40 millimeter anti-aircraft weapons up to the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen. We deployed them on each side of the bridge you know, to get ready for the, what we knew was to take place, the attack by the Stukas and what the Messerschmitts 202s, which were the first jet hiring fighters that were deployed by anybody in warfare. And so I was, I had my headquarters and his operations control for, for it in, down on the, down on the lower level below the bridge where the resident buildings were. Well, excuse me. And the next day it was a thrill to see our guns shoot out Stuka dive bombers come into the Ludendorff Bridge. We, well, I don't know how we shot out quite a few stupid dive bombers. Then the infantry moved across the bridge, and boy, I tell you, that saved hundreds, thousands of lives to be able to capture that bridge and move our infantry and establish a beachhead on the eastern shore of the Rhine River. It was the only remaining uh, bridge crossing the Rhine. And that was <laughs> right interesting. The where we live now, there's uh, I live in a in a uh, Hunt Cliff, uh, which is an independent living apartment for old folks like us. And there's a German there, German fellow, who, when he was about 14 years old, was sent by his he, he's Jewish, sent by his folks from Germany over to Texas because they knew he was going he would perish too as being a Jew. And he grew up in Texas, went to school, and later got into the army and became an interpreter. And I discovered that he was one of the first persons to cross the Ludendorff Bridge. And I said, Peter, I saw you up there. 
we were crossing the bridge and I was down below and we were keeping track of our guns and getting ready to, for the show on the next day. And you were one of the first ones. Isn't that amazing? So you were really both much. there at the same time. <laughs> and he, I live, we lived in the same apartment building. <laughs> but it, so we got across the, and that was the beginning of the end, of course, when then there was. Phew. Do you remember where you were when Roosevelt died and hearing about the news? No, I, I don't. Uh, I thought about it. I have in my big box of things, I have the Stars and Tripes uh, newspaper uh, that uh, headlines Roosevelt died. I've got a lot of in my files, a lot of the old Stars and Tripes and um, all the publications, uh, not a, some samples of publications that were the, uh, and I have that one, so Roosevelt died. How know. far into Germany did you go? Where were you when the war actually ended? I was in just east of, uh, of um, I was in Mugen, Mugendorf, uh, Forkheim, which is just east of uh, Nuremberg. And when it was over, we were, our unit was stationed at a, at a uh, beautiful chateau on a hill with some German industrialists, just luxury, swimming pool and horses and everything. <laughs> Had it feel good? The war was over? Huh? Felt good? The war was oh, over? Yeah. And then we were right entering. We were um, uh, entering. We were sent, our unit was sent, given a R and R leave to go to Switzerland. And we and we had one of the orders to go to the Pacific, but before we went, we had an R and R leave. And we went on a got the train, went down to San Moritz. And on the train to Switzerland, there was a group of uh, nurses, army nurses, who had also were going on a R and R leave before they also shipped. And I met my wife then. I met. You met her on the train or in Switzerland? On, uh, I met her on the train with, with a group. Of, uh, and we stayed. The, the our group, a group of junior officers, stayed at the uh, Palace Hotel in San Moritz. Of course, the nurses, they stayed at some crummy place, I imagine. <laughs> but that's where I met them. And then when we went back to, to Forkheim, and she was stationed up in Norsham, where we would occasionally be able to see each other. We finally got, getting, later we married in her home in Iowa. You were, you were there until April of 46. How long was she there before she came home? Well, she came, I got, no, I wasn't there till April. I came back to the U.S. in um, going about Christmas of '45. Then I'm gonna leave. It permitted me to be, you know, be on payroll until April or whatever it was. And she came about back about the same time. Matter of fact, when she came in, I met her in New York, and I have a picture of us at the uh, taking the dinner at the uh, what's that famous. Dining club in New York, a man had I can't think, but no, we were, we met in August of 40, 40, uh, 40, 45. 45. And when did you marry? In May of, no, August of 44. The invasion was in 44. Uh, let's see, then. All the way through, so it should be 45, August of 45. 45. And then we married in. 46 in Iowa, which is, was, was her home, Algona, Iowa. And we moved to Richmond. I went back to working at the Life Insurance Company of Virginia and became a, um, by examination, became a fellow of the Society of Actuaries. And then after I got my fellowship, uh, the actuary of the company and I, the associate actuary, left and organized Bowles, Andrews, and Town. Children? We have, um, we've had four children, one deceased at age 10, boy, Douglas Bowles, and three children, both all of whom are married, and each um, has children. And one of our sons is um, now divorced and married again, and he acquired two additional children. So we have, we have three, five blood grandchildren and two step-grandchildren.
you know, well, one of the sons with the three girls, three granddaughters, lives in Seattle, Washington. And, uh, but that's the that's the story, I reckon. <laughs> Was there anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't cover? Well, I never thought about what I wanted to talk about. So the uh, how do you? Because when we talked about this in the beginning, you, you were on a career path that was interrupted with the war, and then you went back to it. How do you feel that the, that the, the war experience may have changed you had, you had it not happened and you'd gone on and yeah. done what you eventually did? Well, I don't think it would have changed my career when the war was over and we were going to be shipped back. We went, I went to, I wrote my mother and asked her to send me some textbooks I was going to need for my next actuarial exam. And one of them was Spurgeon's Life Contingencies, which was always a tough exam. And she sent it to me in, in Germany. And then we went to Marseille to get on our boat to come home. I spent most of my time on the boat studying for that examination. The rest of the fellows couldn't understand why the hell I would be doing that. But I said, well, i got, I got to do it. Go take the exam. You're ready to get on with your life. Yeah, yeah get on with my life. And I came back with the life of Virginia. We were married, and then a year later, we were married, and well, we were married. <laughs> and then um, when I got my, the year I got my fellowship in the Society of Actuaries, I resigned from the life of Virginia, and the act, chief actuary resigned. We organized the firm and uh, went into consulting. And a lot of firms, it was called Bowles, Andrews, and Town when we organized it in October of 40, 48, I reckon. And then we, uh, uh, let's see, later, T. Coleman Andrews, who was Andrews, uh, he had been president of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, been all the offices in Virginia you could think of. And, he joined our well, he joined our firm, and then we were going to open a New York office. We were having a reception at the Biltmore Hotel. I never will forget this. And uh, then one of the rooms where you, you throw parties, uh, Coleman Andrews was there. He had uh, was a very good friend of uh, Gene Tunney, the boxer. <laughs> he had friends all over everywhere. While we were in a reception there at the hotel, the telephone rang down. I answered the phone and said, "This is uh, is T. Coleman Andrews uh, there at your reception?" I said, "Yes, I'd like to speak to him." And so uh, this was the year that Eisenhower was elected president. I forgot what year it was, but Coleman took the phone and it was uh, well, this fellow. The fellow became Secretary of Treasury. I'm embarrassed how I can't recall his name, but he said that. Eisner wanted me to call you and ask you if you'd be Commissioner of Internal Revenue. So Coleman accepted the job, being he became Commissioner of Internal Revenue of the U.S. and then resigned from our firm because it had been a conflict of interest. And uh, so those were the, we'd go, occasionally go to meetings and get Coleman to come and <clears throat> with Gene Tunney and all those big wigs. I mean, at, at White Sulphur Springs in West Virginia. To get those wealthy guys parading down with a band saying, Poor people of Paris. I never forget that. Singing, Poor people of Paris. <laughs> but uh, as the old saying goes, uh, them were the days. <laughs> Did you ever keep up with any army buddies or go to reunions? I never went to reunions. No, our folks were scattered. You know, when our headquarters was relatively small. One of them we stayed in touch with, and we'd see, my wife and I would see him and his wife occasionally. He married a girl from Great Britain, and they moved, of course, she moved back to the States, and he's now deceased. But uh, he's the only one we maintain close contact with for all these many years. Many years. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time today and sharing your your thoughts and your memories with us. Thank well, you. Thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> You're welcome. Okay. It was a real uh, emotional experience with my grandson at uh, the you know, cemetery there in Normandy.
we've got pictures of him and of the three of us together. Some Frenchman took of us that was looking at Normandy Beach. Then we were in Paris and they took him to the top of the Eiffel Tower. And then we went to the top of the, uh, what's the big thing on Champs Elysees? The, the, the Arc of Triomphe. Arc de Triomphe. We go to the top of that and I got pictures of him looking over that to the Eiffel Tower. And quite an experience to take him over. I'm sure it meant a lot to your family to, to be yeah, there to see where a, you were. It meant a lot to my grandson, too. He's now 13 years old. He was in about 11 or two years ago. And my wife and I and some of my family went to the 50th reunion, which was in, what, 94? 94? 94. 50th reunion, uh, 50th anniversary. Then I went back, my wife and I went back on the 60th anniversary. Then I took my son and grandson later to, went to the earth and Normandy and quite an experience. They'll, they'll never forget it, neither will I, because I want to.